So, um, in multicultural societies, uh, we, we often often discuss homicide and uh, culture as sort of mutually incompatible. And I, I use this word multicultural with trepidation because I think that's also a very com complicated concept and not necessarily always uh, applicable. But my previous book uh, and edited collection with the title Gender and Multiculturalism from a North South Perspective, we, we look at it from a theoretical perspective. And what I'm talking about this afternoon is the empirical work to inform some of our um, theoretical perspectives that we work with. So we, we talk about, we think about rights as universal, so applying to everyone, but cultures in particular, only applying to some people, some groups. And we always then argue that uh, rights should trump culture. In other words, right now, when, we, when those two things conflict, we have to actually um, come out on the side of rights. So one of the first feminist articulations about um, this conflict and the perceived conflict of rights and culture is in the book of Susan Mara Oaken. She was an American theorist with the title is Multiculturalism Bad for Women. And this is about harmful cultural practices that conflict with women's equality. Um, and her, of course, argument was, is that the case? Yes, absolutely. So she wrote about the head scarf, honor clips, female circumcision, and so on. But feminists in, in, in the global north think about these clashes as minority cultures, right? So, and, and specifically with the migration of people, um, that these harmful cultural practices are the practices of minority cultures that do not abide by the universal of, of the, uh, the constitution, for example. But in the global south, very often, it's the cultures of minority people. And, and we see that there's this sort of thinking about culture of others is viewed as sexually essentialized and unfeminine. Um, and it's always measured against white hegemonic cultures. And there's a wonderful book that's just come out with the title is not about the Burka. And this is the written by Arab feminists, so um, all of them are Muslim. And they, they talk about this idea that the West has that <coughs> if you wear a, a or a burqa, um, you are not equally as good. It's a wonderful book to read to, to see why, you know, they, that women have to face it in, in how they perceive their cultural practices. Um, and I think what, what happens is that we very often blind to the harmful cultural practices that women have. Um, and also who decides what is harm. So there's an imposition on, on um, other cultures that, that their practices are harmful. And so what we wanted to do with this research is to actually look at understandings um, of what people's own understandings of their cultures. And there you can see, I think, something that, that expresses the sort of, um, the one thinks that because uh, she, she's covered and only her eyes show that um, she's oppressed, and the other one thinks, what if you get your class right? She's wearing nothing, more or less. And, and, and these are sort of the different interpretations, and they can all um, be traced back to our cultural understandings. Now, culture very often is used to actually control women's mm -hmm. women sexuality, um, and it's also very important for the reproduction of national identity. Um, we, we often hear uh, the talk about women as the mothers of the nation, right? And this is a, it's a sort of a, the ANC Women's League often use this when they talk about the nation and, and women's place uh, in, in the nation. So as the reproducers of the nation, we then also then in a way fix them as mothers and caregivers. But women also become the symbols of the honor of the nation and very often the honor of families. Honor killings, right, where um, girls in certain cultures, if they have relationships outside their culture, it will be the father's order of to kill them. And if you want to, to uh, watch a film on this that I think is, is really 
explaining the stairwell is um, the Dahi River. Um, it is about a, a girl who survived uh, an honor killing, and, and it traces this whole what happens to her after um, her father tried to kill her. Um, so, in post colonial context, um, there's often the view that liberalism, so the universal norm, has replaced all the space cultural practices that undermine individual life. And we are critical of the post colonial society. And we often hear about the cultural defense. So, the cultural defense is when people will say, but in my culture, right? So, the cultural defense can also be used to defend practices that indeed violate human or women's rights. So in my culture, and this is what Zuma said during his rape trial, you cannot leave an aroused woman, you have to satisfy her. And this was to justify non-consensual sex. All right. Um, it is un-African to be gay, a maker Steve McCrow and a question, and Chief Mandela Mandela um, about Ukutwala. Now Ukutwala, um, the origins of Ukutwala is and a boy were in a relationship and they were not going to marry. His family would abduct her, but it's just to take her to his family while they care for her and they go to the bright side, or a bola, which is the bright side. Um, but this has become completely distorted. Um, we, we now have cases, and, and I worked with this when I was a commissioner, where the old men um, abduct very young girls. Um, Two sisters. Um, and the mother came to the commission to say that she wants her daughter back, but the police refused to help her because they say, in my culture or our culture, Ukutwala is acceptable. There was also a case here in Cape Town of a man that um, abducted a 14 year old girl, um, and he was then, uh, there was a court case, and he was sentenced to 15 years in jail for abduction and rape. And up to the very last, his last day in court, he kept saying, um, yeah, he kept saying, I did nothing wrong, this is part of my culture. So, part of understanding this, these perceptions on culture is also then to study the gender gap. Now, the gender gap um, is basically the differences between the other groups of men and women. Um, and we haven't done a lot of studies about the gender gap uh, in the African context. But the first study was by Pamela Johnson Conover that saw it in the American context um, that actually wanted to understand uh, the differences between men's and women's participating in the workforce. And the reason for that was that at that time, uh, it was when Ronald Reagan was elected as president. And Women in very large numbers didn't vote for the Republican Party, his party, but voted for the Democratic Party. And it became known as the Reagan's Women's Problem. And then it became studied um, by academics who then, and, and it was then called the gender gap. But what she found was there were very limited differences between the attitudes of men and women, especially about sex roles, because, you know, if we go back, ideas about men being breadwinners and women being caregivers and so on has a long history. But that was very limited difference between men and women about those roles. But what she found was that there's a big difference between women who are feminist and men who are feminist and other uh, women. So, so that, of course, it speaks about a certain consciousness about uh, the impact of, of sex roles and so on, because she worked in the, in the 1970s and 80s. Um, so, but what she contributed, and that is an important um, methodological instrument, is the feminist identity thermometer. So it is a, it looks like, if you, if you look at the questionnaire, it looks like a little thermometer with zero at the bottom or 100 at the top, and then you, you ask people, so how close where would you put yourself on this thermometer? And clearly, um, people who were very close to the top were feminists. She, uh, she then um, made this argument around being able to identify feminism and uh, feminist identity. And it, it, it was a very useful methodological tool, and it was the first time that it was used. We used it in our research 
research that I'm going to talk about. But we changed it to feminist identity because, you know, I don't, be, if you work with a sample of South Africans, it's not clear how many people have heard of feminism or understand feminism. So we, we changed it to support for gender equality. And I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, I think the, the most, one of the most important comparative studies is by Ingelhardt and Norris uh, uh, with a, in a book called The Rising Tide. But use the World Value Survey. Now, the World Value Survey is a survey that's done every five years. It started out with only a few countries. By now, there are over 60 countries in, in the uh, World Value Survey, and South Africa is one of uh, one of them. Um, and, and they looked at it at the, the macro level, and the argument is that attitudes change with economic development. Um, so also the uh, Sales change when women become uh, involved in, in the labor force. But this is viewed more or less as a process of modernization and as a linear process, right? So you have um, people who are in more developing, if you if you we talk about the global south, more developing countries that will have economic uh, development uh, ensues and, and women become more taken up in labor uh, but in a linear way. Uh, so, like I said, very little research, uh, specifically in sub-Saharan Africa. And there are a few, um, not necessarily studies, but few items included in the Afro Barometer, which is like the World Value Survey, but it is for Africa. But the data has never really been analyzed um, and, and written about uh, in with specific focus on the gender gap. And I think one of the few studies uh, was the one by Coffey and Walsendahl that um, argue, and, and this is again this sort of linear idea that modernization and cultural isomorphism, and what that means is that you have a diffusion effect. Uh, so changes in the West um, will affect developing countries at the same rate. So you have certain Region, and then you will see uh, there will be a time lag, but you will see the same type of, of changes happening in developing countries. Uh, and, and how this sort of uh, plays itself out in terms of if we talk about political participation, for example, and in voting behavior, is that um, women start out with conservative attitudes, um, and this is one of the things that um, the, the World Value Survey found uh, in, in the beginning, uh, you know, when this sort of uh, the World Value Survey started, was that when it comes to fundamentalism, women are more fundamentalist than men. And I mean, I don't know, there's never been a very good explanation for that. But the argument is that women, you have conservative attitudes, and then you have a de-alignment of that, those attitudes, which means they start to change. And then eventually they change into more progressive attitudes or even more progressive than the attitudes of men. Um, and this is, uh, we've, we've seen this in the United States, for example, where uh, up to that point where Reagan became the president, uh, women sort of in, in the same numbers voted for the Republican and the Democratic Party. And after Reagan, it shifted toward women more um, progressive attitudes, more women. Uh, voted for the Democratic Party. It was one or two elections that it dipped and then came Trump. And so we, we still have great, well, I mean, there are re reasons why uh, Trump, but the greatest support for Trump came from the So they did. So, so that theory then actually became quite, uh, you know, we, we need to rethink our theories. But uh, what, what Coffey and Bolsendahl found was that um, women, uh, and South Africa is not part of the study, that women actually participate in, in the, more, the less conflictual types of participation. So they'll sign petitions or they will listen to politicians, but they don't, won't get actively involved. And they also found that women register in lower numbers than men. Now, this is interesting. In the last two elections in South Africa, in, the, in 2009, we had 1 million more women registered than men, and then 2014, 2 million more women. 
So South Africa does not really fit the existing um, uh, findings of, of, like I say, very, there are not many studies to, to look at. But context is very important, and they've looked at corruption. And what they also then found is that the longer women have to vote, uh, the, the more likely they are to vote, and the more likely it is that corruption will make them vote in a way to counter uh, corruption. So this study that we've done in uh, 2018 by Citizen Surveys, with a sample of 1,300 South Africans, so random stratified means it, it's uh, done in all the provinces, um, in proportionally all the, the race groups, um, and also um, economic differences and so on. So, uh, and, and that's important. You can't just take a random sample of South Africa. You can give a lot of random distribution. So, uh, the the um, the sampling process is, is very important. Now, of that sample, 48% uh, were was men and 52% women. 50% uh, urban, 30% semi-urban, and 20% rural. And this is important because you have 19 million South Africans living in the rural areas um, under customary law, and, and we know that customary law is, uh, well, it's changed, and I'll talk about that, but I would say that all cultures in South Africa are also quite in detail. Now, what we wanted to do to establish some um, relationship with the World Value uh, Survey is to uh, use one of the um, a set of indicators um, from the World Value Survey, and this is done with uh, what we call a, li a Likert scale, so it's a five-point scale, strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, or don't know, or don't want to answer. So, um, and, and what I will show you my results is that we've combined strongly agree and agree into one category, and strongly disagree and disagree into one category. So these are the items of the World Value Survey. On the whole, men make better political leaders than women do. So this is to look at gender equality. In jobs of skills, men should have more right to a job than women. A university education is more important for a boy than a girl. Women should have children in order to be fulfilled. If a woman wants to have a child as a single parent, she does not want to uh, have a stable relationship with her. And a man be used to abuse her. Um, now, the thing with the World Value Survey is because it's been going on for more than 20 years, it's like 30 years now, you cannot change the items uh, because people track it longitudinally, what we call longitudinal studies, so over time. And so if you change one of these items, uh, well, you're not allowed to. But I look at this and I, I've always been uncomfortable because I felt it doesn't really speak to to our context. So there you see the findings um, of the of the those items, and you will see that um, there is a, a gender gap if you look at men and women. But what is more important is that um, all these um, percentages are higher than 50%, which means that um, you know people disagree, men disagree. Um, that over 50% uh, men make better political leaders, or when jobs are scarce, and then you can see women um, are quite high. It's a big gap there. Um, but look at this when education is more important uh, for a boy than a girl, you see very high percentages disagree. So, so people clearly don't think that. Um, and, and here I think. It speaks more to our conditions, where there are so many single parents households, right? It's a rule in South Africa, it's not a major problem. So it's not really testing perceptions. I think it's testing something else. And um, but we see that it's not as though this uh, a men agree with some of these uh, items uh, that that are quite, I would say, then testing for. A sexist understanding of the world. But so what we did was uh, we've decided that we wanted actually to use 
uh, and develop new items, new, uh, what we call, we call, do you put it on the slide here? Oh. <laughs> These, we call them indica indicators, right? So those are the things you use to actually uh, develop your variables with. So there were 17 items to measure culture, um, and we did a factor analysis. Now, for those of you who don't know what a factor analysis is, that if you have so many variables, right, 17 items, 17 variables, it's very difficult to work with. So you try to combine them into different, what well, we call them factors, factor scores, and then you use them as combined variables. Um, and so what we, with those 17 items, we actually have three factors. Culture, gender equality, and tradition. That's, that's how we label them. And um, I don't have to worry about that now. I'm going to talk about them. But you can see 0.6 on this side, right? Um, those are really good factor scores. And year two, and year three. So it, it, it shows you very clearly that that one measures something else, this one measures something else, and that one measures something else. So and that's why we call them culture, equality, and tradition. Okay, now look at this. This is culture. Um, look at how high uh, the scores are in here. Uh, they're all very high, about 60%, and at the same, lower for women, and there is a gap you can see. Um, women should listen when traditional leaders speak. Men are higher. My culture, women should listen to their husbands. That's where the title comes from. Look, men and women don't speak. Public though they say no, this is not that should be the case. Women should take their husband's last name. Uh, women should have their identity tested if it's part of their culture. They see but lower, but not the big gap. Uh, men should listen where traditional leaders speak, also high. But lower is this for the women, right? So um, maybe men should listen to the person listening so much. Uh, traditional leaders play an important role in society. Now, what this tells us is that people support these notions of culture, right? So, so culture in terms of um, the importance of traditional leaders, but also the importance of a certain hierarchy between men and women, right? So, you know, you you listen to your husband. Um, and this issue of the, the genetic testing, now this is one of, of the issues that, that's considered harmful cultural factors. Uh, and I don't know if you remember, about two or three years ago, the ANC said that they would give bursaries to women students if they can remain virgins until they graduate. Right? Um, and of course, then that have to be tested once a year. And, and the outcry was about the fact that this is really um, conflicting uh, with the Bill of Rights, right? the uh, right to privacy, right to bodily integrity, um, uh, right to, to not be discriminated against on grounds of, of gender and so on. But the other issue, of course, is that you, you put all the responsibility for safe sex on the shoulders. So the Commission for Gender Equality and women's organizations, um, there was huge outcry and in the end it didn't happen. But it tells you about, and, and also why we have a, a, a resurfacing of virginity testing that wasn't used for quite a while, is because of HIV AIDS, right? So also trying to, to, to deal with um, infections that puts the responsibility uh, on women. All right. So the second um, factor there, um, your culture supports the idea that men and women are equal. Labor laws and outdated tradition, we should do away with family law. We should never change cultural practices, even if they have given the values and traditions of my community are more important than individual rights. Now what you see here is that these percentages are not high. Right? And the gap um, is much smaller except for years, right? We should never change practices even if they have been. Um, but it tells us that people also 
respect ideas of equality, right? So they feel strongly about culture, uh, to a lesser degree about equality, but it's um, really for, for uh, something like uh, the bright the baller. People disagree that it should be outlawed, um, but they also um, say that in their cul cultures there is support for women and men uh, or, or gender equality. Okay, so um, and this uh, and also this last one I think is important. Values and traditions of my community are more important than individual rights. They're not saying in, in high percentages that this is the case, and they, but they, they do disagree that, um, you know, I think there's, there's sort of this conflict between culture and, you know, what should they pick, right? Um, and, and I think this is part of, of this notion that people live hybrid lives, and I'm, I'm going uh, to, to come to that. Tradition. Now, here you see... Um, something very interesting. Look, look at how high that is. Uh, in my culture, it's acceptable for men to have many sex partners. Uh, in my culture, it is acceptable to discipline a woman by slapping her. Look, disagree on both of them. Quite high, right? You can feel quite strongly about that. Uh, and men, okay, that's something else. Women should be virgins when they are made. I think this speaks more to people's um, also, idea about sex partners. I would have expected um, men that it should be higher for men, uh, but it's not. Uh, women should have female circumcision um, if it's part of their culture. And you can see there um, the majority of women disagree with that. So, if we go back to those, those first two, these things that we attribute to culture or tradition, people say it's not part of their culture. So, so if we then call labor partners, it is not culture, right? It, these are distortions of culture that is very often used as the cultural defense, but it is not perceived by people as part of their culture. And I think that's very important about uh, this finding. And then um, gender-based violence, so we also ask uh, about gender-based violence. Men be driven uh, because they feel undermined by women's rights. Mm -hmm. And you can see that people agree with that. Um, men feel unable to provide for their families beat up women. Look how high is it for women. There's a big gap here between women and men. Um, any woman who gets beaten up is looking for it. But the disagree is very high. And then men beat women um, up to control them. So women very high there. And women who know their place will not get beaten up. So, so in a sense, one can say that the last one conflicts with the women um, was looking for it. Uh, and, and this, of course, is always the thing about how you phrase a question, right? And it builds in a certain uh, uh, reliability check. Um, but I think it, it does speak to some of our theories about the violence, right? We've seen the past week uh, the, the very high levels of very brutal violence and intimate genocide and death. They feel, they feel undermined, um, they, they feel impotent because they're not breadwinners, they emasculate if you want to emasculate. Uh, and still cry. So women still cry. That's one of the main reasons why there's so much violence. And of course, we don't. The, the violence is very complex. It, uh, we we can't just use one theory to explain it. Right? At least it's not a topic about the perceptions of women and men about the violence, and even medical <laughs> women. But when they are powerless, you know, they just live in this thing. More than 50. So then, of course, they they can be restricted statistics. So we also did a multiple regression, so that's a more advanced statistical technique. 
And we build a regression model uh, to test for the significance of the independent variable. So these, um, you want to explain what's going on here. So we look at, we look at gender, but we also then add in race, we add in religion, and degree of urbanization. And what we found is that all the um, regression coefficients are significant at 0.00. So what that means is that it's minus significant, um, and if we find that there is a gender gap, and even you know when we show it in the different statistics, sometimes it's big and sometimes it's not so big. So it is significant statistically, but the variance explained is small. Now this is the puzzle here, and it's not the first time I've had this puzzle in, in my course. When we say variance, it's just when we say variance explained, it means you want uh, the relationship between that what you want to explain and your independent variables to be strong. So if you have, like, say, one thing explains 80% of the variance. Say, for example, religion explains 80% of the variance. Right? Religious people, um, women are more submissive. So religion explains the gender gap. Of all those variant, uh, variables combined, and we put them in and say, put them out in different combinations where we really try to find something. Explains less than 20 percent. So clearly there's something else, right? And there's that something else. But um, I, I mean, I'm at the, at the beginning of this, this project, so we will look deeper into the data and you know do data transformation and so on to see if we get um, a difference. Or indeed, a greater percentage of variance explained. Um, so, so we find that there's gender gap, but we don't. We're not sure exactly what's causing it. So, um, and in other research where we've had the situation, it comes. It boils down to the South African context, right? That there are some things in the South African context um, that that's even bigger than our our identity. Um, and, and, I, and that's very difficult to capture with this, this type of project if you don't know what it is. Right? But we have other variables that we haven't looked at yet. And, and um, we also may come up something with, with this issue of <coughs> organization or, or, or the difference between rural and urban and so on. And we need to work with the data, not me. All right, so what, what we can say at this point about this project is that there's a very amateur men and women regarding culture, tradition, and politics, but it's small. Uh, the findings confirm that men and women support both culture, tradition, and heritage of equality, and that there's no conflict between equality and culture and that traditions are juxtaposed. And you saw that very clearly with the, the, the one that chapter that was uh, included in here. Um, just the, the percentages there was much lower. So, um, and, but both men and women oppose violence as part of their culture, right? They, they don't view it as part of their culture. Men are slipping, uh, slapping women to discipline them. But they also support cultural practices that can innate and underlying equality. So, for example, in Britain, we also saw that they said that if uh, female circumcision is part of your culture, um, you know, that should be supported. So, so there, there's, um, I think, conflicting or contradictory um, attitudes, uh, but that's not unusual uh, for people to have that. Um, it confirms that people lead hybrid lives, often migrating between urban and rural areas where culture is, is strong. So, so they may, for example, you know, in urban areas, be much more exposed to ideas of equality. And then when they go back to traditional areas, then they are again exposed to traditions. And and it's very difficult to challenge tradition. I think very often people do that. Even if they feel uncomfortable about it, they, they won't challenge it. Um, so, so what this means is that modernization is not a linear process. Uh, 
you know, I think these things all added up and, and the spark of isomorphism also that it happens in a linear way. And, and what I'm saying is that it's not a linear process and it's uh, this isomorphism is dynamic and continuous, uh, depending on uh, what you know, the global context. And I think right now we are in a very interesting moment in, in the global history of, of people migrating and how we are going to see these um, different um, cultures uh, in and already. I think we saw, we saw a lot of this process in the ideas of cultures and, and traditions people view as coming into a specific country. Now, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, I'm talking about the global project of the global project, and that this is a global movement in history. So that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I think that we also on, on the sort of more different cultural or traditions, um, that, that there will be, uh, as the case was with Mara Hilton, it was with the Anglo or the the new start, and in the end, to be consistent, they also have to have your uh, into three, um, also in the those global systems. <coughs> so, so I am, um, in, in my mind, it's not the correct way of dealing with it. It's, um, it's about understanding how cultures contribute to people's identity. And this is why I think this book is not about the book that I said I thought that there was a little speak um, about the fact that the parents in the book. Um, we see what happened with the Bikini Mama. This is the um, Muslim women on the beach where clothes that come with cover for you. And, and you try to stay in the ocean. Why don't we get those on the beaches? Because they will not be found. And that's what I think this idea of these local uh, refugee cultures being more important to the So, so I think that um, in, in the book, very much the populism, I made that argument that what happens um, with family law is that it will codify. On the scenario. So before we start it, 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 it remains the same. And there were also a lot of attacks between the colonial administrators and um, the, uh, the traditional leaders. And, and those attacks were to the detriment of women. They were very patriarchal. <coughs> so what we need is to see uh, the development of and um, the Shabbat, uh, who is now deputy uh, speaker of the Mara issue, he has written up a very interesting paper where he has two very interesting things out. And he says, in our days, the notion of whether or not we are able to have land as a thought. And in the other days, he wrote uh, He will consider that as a form of cultural union and visual rights. And, and there is far more culture in, in the Roman village than there was the custom in those days in Paul. In a very sort of static uh, way versus in the other way. And, and we will have more equality um, in that way. So it's also about the development of the global cultural movement. Uh, so, I think if we talk about intangible states, most of my research, I think, um, the thought is the root of poetry, which is um, issue, Patrick Shaw is issue of modern poetry. And this is about how we could influence um, government policy to bring our citizens out of poverty. Um, I think if we Back about, for example, the vision of Fort Sill. I don't know how many of you have the tradition of Fort Sill received. It was very good. It was um, actually uh, built uh, in the end of the parliament because two of the Moroccan women started the industry. They were like 